Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Chandana um, and uh, we are all here to discuss a uh, few procedures that are performed in the management of varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency. Before actually uh, discussing the procedures, let, let us brush up on the lower limb venous anatomy. Uh, the venous system of the lower limb comprises of the superficial, deep and perforator systems. The superficial system is located superficial to the deep fascia of the limb and uh, it consists of two uh, main territories the great saphenous uh, vein and the short saphenous vein the great saphenous vein is actually a continuation of the medial end of the dorsal venous arch and uh, it ascends in front of the uh, medial malleolus uh, along the medial aspect of the leg and when it reaches the level of the medial femoral condyle it loops posteriorly and ascends up the uh, posterior medial aspect of the thigh uh, and uh, dips into the uh, cribriform fascia at the saphenous opening uh, at the level of the saphenofemoral junction which is generally situated uh, at a point 4 cm lateral and below the level of the pubic tubercle. So all along its course the great saphenous vein receives several tributaries. Mm, the most important tributary in the leg is the posterior arch vein of Leonardo uh, which communicates with the deep venous system uh, by means of uh, cocket perforators, cocket 1, cocket 2 and cocket 3 uh, which are uh, located at levels of 5, 10 and 15 centimeters respectively from the ankle joint. A few other important uh, tributaries of the great saphenous vein are the anterior tributary of the leg, the anterior or lateral accessory saphenous vein and the medial accessory saphenous vein. Uh, in addition to these, just before the saphenous vein, great saphenous vein terminates in the uh, saphenofemoral junction, uh, it receives a few named territory uh, uh, tributaries uh, uh, which are the superficial circumflex iliac vein, the superficial inferior epigastric vein, the superficial external uh, pudendal vein and also the deep external pudendal vein. And uh, uh, throughout its length, the great saphenous vein communicates with the uh, deep venous system by means of uh, several perforators. For example, the 24 centimeter perforator and the proximal paratibial perforators in the leg, the below knee perforator or the Boyd perforator, the above knee perforator or Dodd perforator, and Hunter's perforator or um, thigh perforator. Um, all these perforators are uh, quite significant. Um, and uh, they are fairly constant in their location. Uh, coming to the short saphenous vein, the short saphenous vein um, is a continuation of the lateral aspect of the dorsal venous arch and ascends up the posterior aspect of the leg behind the lateral malleolus. Uh, it terminates at the saphenopopliteal junction uh, where it pierces the deep fascia of the leg and uh, enters the uh, popliteal vein. Uh, the level of this saphenopopliteal junction is highly variable. Uh, it can be a few centimeters uh, below the level of the uh, popliteal fossa, within the popliteal fossa or a few centimeters above the level of the popliteal fossa. There is one uh, communicating vein known as the communicating vein of uh, geocomini which is uh, basically a cranial extension of the short saphenous vein and uh, through this vein it communicates with the great saphenous vein. Uh, a few other important anatomical points are uh, that the great saphenous vein uh, is accompanied by the saphenous nerve from the level of the knee up to the ankle and the short saphenous vein is accompanied by the sural nerve. Let us now talk about the deep venous system. Uh, the deep venous system of the leg uh, is formed by uh, the venae comitantis or the accompanying veins of the three main arteries of the leg or the crural arteries namely the anterior tibial artery, the posterior tibial artery and the peroneal artery. So the venae comitantis of these uh, vessels um, combine with the uh, uh, veins uh, within the soleus and the gastronemius to form the popliteal vein and this popliteal vein courses uh, through the adductor hiatus into the subsartorial canal beyond which point it is uh, known by the name of femoral vein. And the femoral vein uh, joins the deep femoral vein to form the common femoral vein and above the level of the inguinal ligament, the common femoral vein is known as the external iliac vein. Uh, coming to the perforators, 
these are uh, veins which connect the superficial and the deep system there are basically two types of perforators direct perforators and indirect perforators direct perforators basically uh, uh, connect the superficial and uh, venous uh, the superficial venous system and the deep venous system uh, directly uh, through a defect in the deep fascia and these are more constant in location the indirect perforators connect the superficial uh, system to the deep uh, system through a muscular vein so it has um, uh, a superficial vein connecting uh, through a indirect perforator to the muscular venous sinus and the muscular venous sinus co connecting through a perforator to the deep vein and these indirect perforators are irregularly distributed so now that we have brushed up on the anatomy uh, let us uh, move over to the interventional procedures that are performed uh, to treat varicose veins or chronic venous insufficiency i will not uh, discuss much about the pathophysiology of chronic venous insufficiency or uh, the development of ambulatory venous uh, hypertension in this video because uh, uh, that will make the video inordinately long uh, so now let us uh, start by talking about um, what we do in uh, order to treat uh, varicose veins or chronic in venous insufficiency so most interventional procedures focus on removal ablation or ligation of the refluxing segment um, and these um, procedures may either be surgical procedures or endovenous procedures in this current era of endovenous um, procedures and minimal access uh, procedures um, is there still a role for surgery uh, the answer is very much so uh, yes because um, there are still a few definitive indications for surgery even in the Uh, current era of endovenous treatment uh, and surgery is preferred over endovenous treatment when the venous segment which is involved is very superficially placed that is if the distance between the venous segment is less than um 1 cm from the skin and if there are very grossly dilated or aneurysmal segments uh, then surgery is preferred also the presence of chronic thrombophlebitis or excessive tortuosity or acute superficial thrombosis all of these prevent the advancement of a catheter in endovenous techniques and therefore surgery is preferred and um, last but not the least uh, economic considerations and physician choice still play a very major role in the choice of procedure let us now start uh, talking about the surgical procedures that are uh, performed for varicose veins uh, so most surgeries uh, can be um, classified uh, under two headings surgeries performed for axial veins and surgery is performed for perforators so for axial veins the by far the most commonly performed surgery is trendelenburg procedure uh, and this may or may not be uh, accompanied by ligation and stripping of the great saphenous vein uh, so what exactly constitutes the trendelenburg procedure so the trendelenburg procedure involves the ligation of the named tributaries of the great saphenous vein with juxta femoral flush ligation of the great saphenous vein uh, this uh, is all that the trendelenburg procedure uh, consists of this may in addition be accompanied by stripping of the great saphenous vein the idea of stripping the vein is to reduce the recurrence rate and um, Uh, this uh, is a fairly straightforward procedure and it is carried out by using something known as a mire or cordman stripper um so let us uh, talk about the steps involved in trendelenburg procedure so the patient is placed in supine position and the limb is scrubbed painted and draped uh, the next step is to place the incision so the incision is uh, generally placed at or a few centimeters one or two finger breadths below the groin crease centered around the um, saphenofemoral junction so we know that the saphenofemoral junction lies approximately 4 cm uh, lateral to and 4 cm below the level of the pubic tubercle so uh, centered around this point we place a, 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 a groin crease incision and uh, you deepen the incision in layers until you identify the great saphenous vein and subsequently the saphenofemoral junction at this point um, you can see several tributaries entering the great saphenous vein so uh, you have to identify all of them uh, ligate them and divide them so the uh, important tributaries that you can encounter here are the superficial inferior epigastric vein the superficial circumflex iliac vein the lateral accessory saphenous vein 
the medial accessory saphenous vein and uh, the superficial external pudendal vein. Uh, sometimes you can also see the deep external pudendal vein which enters either the uh, great saphenous vein or the femoral vein. So once you have addressed all these uh, territories, uh, tributaries, you proceed uh, by performing something known as a juxtafemoral flush ligation of the great saphenous vein. So the idea here is to be careful enough to avoid any uh, injury to the femoral vein while also um, performing a ligation uh, which is um, uh, flush enough to avoid leaving an extensive blind stump of the great saphenous vein. So the idea here is to uh, transfix and ligate the great saphenous vein as close to the femoral vein as possible without actually injuring the femoral vein. So once you do this, uh, you are you are basically um, done with the Trendelenburg procedure. This is all that the Trendelenburg procedure entails. This can uh, be uh, complemented by actually stripping the great saphenous vein. Uh, so this is an adjunctive procedure. It is not a part of Trendelenburg procedure. Uh, I am uh, stressing this because uh, a lot of people believe that Trendelenburg procedure also involves stripping of the great saphenous vein and it is not so. But stripping is almost always done because it uh, helps uh, to greatly reduce the rate of recurrence. So uh, for stripping, a flexible stripper, a Meyer or a Cordman stripper is introduced through a venotomy. So there are two ways to do this. Now that you have already exposed the great saphenous vein in the thigh, you can uh, perform a uh, venotomy uh, downstream from the point where you have ligated the uh, great saphenous vein. Or uh, you can uh, uh, choose to uh, introduce the stripper uh, somewhere distally and usually this point uh, will be somewhere uh, just below the knee or at the knee. The idea of uh, not stripping the great saphenous vein below the level of the knee is that from the level of the knee up to the ankle, the great saphenous vein is in very close relationship with the saphenous nerve and so stripping the, the vein uh, in this segment can cause injury to the saphenous nerve. So, um, so you uh, pass the stripper either up the uh, course of the vein or down the course of the vein uh, depending on where you have performed the venotomy and uh, you deliver the um, other end uh, of the stripper uh, through a counter incision and all along the length of the vein uh, while uh, uh, progressively uh, pushing the stripper you can palpate the head of the stripper and once you deliver the uh, head of the stripper through a counter incision the head is usually uh, unscrewed and replaced by a slightly larger olive and uh, uh, once you have done that um, the vein at the point of the exit of the stripper is circumferentially dissected out and it is secured to the stripper um, and once you have done this uh, you can um, also address the perforators at this level that is, if uh, the patient also has perforator incompetence, you can uh, per perform perforation, uh, per perforator surgeries such as uh, perforator ligation. And then uh, once you have done all this, you uh, uh, begin uh, stripping the uh, vein. So stripping is performed by uh, gentle but firm tugging circular movements until the entire uh, length of the vein around the stripper is avulsed out and uh, delivered through the wound uh, and uh, immediately after you do this you have to elevate the limb and apply compression uh, uh, dressing and once you have done this you have to ensure hemostasis and close, close the groin incision. So this is um, uh, by and large uh, um, uh, a summary of the steps that are performed in uh, treatment of axial veins. Um, sometimes uh, you may also have to address the short saphenous vein uh, but in most cases this is generally avoided because short saphenous uh, venous incompetence is quite rare and even if it is present it may not contribute significantly to the chronic venous insufficiency of the limb and uh, uh, in addition to all this there are several technical difficulties associated with uh, surgery over the short saphenous vein because it's a posterior vein you may have to uh, transfer the patient into a prone position uh, but um, you may have to do um, surgery for the short saphenous vein in a couple of cases where 
there may be posterior calf varicosities which are quite significant and prominent and uh, if, if it is a case of recurrent varicose veins you may have to uh, address the short venous vein as well and uh, if the patient has isolated lateral malleolar ulcers which fall in the territory of the short saphenous vein now you may have to uh, attribute the incompetence to the short uh, saphenous territory and also if there are recurrent ulcers uh, despite perforator ligation you may have to address the short saphenous vein one other uh, surgery that is pro performed for axial veins is something known as an ambulatory phlebectomy so this uh, basically uh, involves uh, multiple uh, small stab incisions along the course of the varicosity and uh, you know delivering the varicosity through the uh, incision and avulsing them uh, so this basically helps us treat the very uh, large and unsightly varicosities along the length of the vein and the idea is that these incisions are quite small and can be closed with uh, something um, as small as a steri strip and it can be done under local anesthesia and um, this is supposed to have a better cosmetic um, uh, result uh, so this is how we address the axial veins uh, so uh, if the patient also has perforator incompetence there are uh, several uh, methods uh, that can be followed in the surgical management mm, one is the linton's method this only has historical value and this uh, involved making a la longitudinal incision along the entire uh, length of the limb to expose and digate the perforators. So uh, quite uh, naturally this was associated with a higher incidence of wound complications and it is uh, seldom done these days. So there is something known as a cockette modification which in involves the extrafacial ligation of perforators and another surgery known as dod and drop uh, surgery uh, which um, uh, entails a posterior medial subfacial approach. The most common uh, open surgery that is performed for addressing perforators is subfacial ligation of perforators, where multiple small skin incisions uh, along the Langer's lines are placed uh, and uh, the perforators are um, delivered and uh, they are ligated either subfacially or uh, subcutaneously. And uh, one point here is that uh, you will have to localize the perforators preoperatively either by uh, Figan's method or uh, by using ultrasound guidance or a combination of both. Um, there are a few newer advances um, uh, in uh, the field of varicose vein surgery. One is known as powered phlebectomy. And here uh, we uh, use uh, this uh, technique to treat uh, extensive branch varicosities. Uh, especially in the case of non-axial uh, veins and recurrent uh, varicose veins. Here the entire course of the varicosity is preoperatively marked and a small incisions of about 2 millimeters are placed at the extremes of the varicosity. And through these incisions uh, you introduce a transilluminator and a resection device um, just to dip the varicosities and then you uh, perform a phlebectomy. Uh, one other uh, advance is uh, SCP, SCPS that is SEPS or subfacial endoscopic perforator surgery. Uh, so this is uh, like creating a plane uh, for an endoscope um, you know um, under the deep fascia and um, uh, this is a minimally invasive approach for um, addressing the perforators. Um, the, for the sake of completion, let us talk a little bit about endovenous techniques for the management of chronic venous insufficiency. I will not uh, go into much detail, but uh, I will just um, try to give you an overview. So most endovenous techniques can be uh, classified under two broad headings, that is thermal methods and non-thermal methods. The thermal methods employ um, a heat energy in order to uh, achieve um, uh, uh, seal or closure of the uh, uh, venous segment in question. So uh, there are two um, important thermal methods namely um, endovenous laser ablation and radio frequency ablation. So what is common to both these techniques is the use of something known as tumescent anesthesia uh, and uh, basically once tumescent anesthesia is um, injected uh, you create a cuff around the vein and also insulate the surrounding structures from thermal injury and uh, here there is um, generation of heat to destroy the endothelial lining which uh, gives rise to a non-infective inflammatory reaction uh, followed by thrombosis and luminal occlusion 
uh, which heals by fibrosis. Um, so um, the complications associated with thermal procedures are vessel perforation, hematoma, thrombosis, phlebitis, infection and uh, inadvertent uh, skin injuries with burns and pigmentation and paresthesia due to nerve injury and there is always a risk of recurrence. The non-thermal uh, methods employed for the treatment of varicose veins are uh, sclerotherapy and mechanochemical ablation and adhesive closure. In sclerotherapy, you can either have uh, liquid sclerotherapy or foam sclerotherapy or even catheter directed sclerotherapy. And here you uh, inject something known as a sclerosing agent will, which will cause inflammation, thrombosis, fibrosis and obliteration of the venous segment. Uh, in mechanochemical ablation, you uh, couple a mechanical injury to the endothelium along with uh, uh, using a sclerosant. In adhesive closure, you inject um, uh, substances such as cyanoacrylate glue which will polymerize once it uh, uh, comes in contact with ionic substances and this will ensure a seal of the lumen of the venous segment. A uh, small note on um, the treatment of uh, recurrence varicose veins. Uh, recurrent varicose veins uh, can either be due to neovascularization or reflux in residual veins or in inadequate initial surgery and uh, new junctional reflux. So this um, is seen in about 10 to 20 percent of the cases. Uh, clinical uh, recurrence is seen only in 10 to 35 percent but if you do a radiological examination it might be present in up to 70 percent. Um, so. Um, uh, one other thing is uh, uh, deep uh, venous insufficiency. Uh, deep venous insufficiency can be treated with um, internal and external valvuloplasty, and external banding, uh, valve transplantation and valve transposition. Here you uh, basically treat uh, incompetent uh, valves by various uh, techniques. And sometimes uh, if the varicose veins are due to a secondary cause that is if it is a secondary venous insufficiency as uh, most commonly seen with a post thrombotic limb you can um, basically perform surgeries to uh, reroute the uh, venous uh, return. So uh, there is one procedure known as Mayhasni procedure which is done for chronic occlusion of the distal ephemeral or proximal popliteal vein and this is basically a saphenopopliteal bypass. That is you um, uh, basically uh, create a conduit between the uh, saphenous vein and the popliteal vein uh, in order to um, bypass the uh, block in the uh, distal part of the uh, femoral vein or the popliteal vein. So uh, if proximal to this block there is a very patent um, uh, uh, um, a patent uh, lumen of the deep venous system. Mm, by ensuring that the um, uh, saphenous uh, vein is uh, draining into the femoral vein, it will provide a route for the venous uh, um, return and thereby uh, decrease the venous insufficiency. This can be um, uh, accompanied by a temporary AV fistula in order to improve the anastomotic patency. One other procedure that can be performed for secondary venous insufficiency is the PAMA procedure or a cross pubic venous bypass. Um, here you um, anastomose the uh, saphenous vein on one side to the femoral vein on the other side thereby bypassing a, uh, an obstruction in the level of the iliac vein. Uh, so there, there can also be hybrid procedures uh, which are performed for various levels of blocks. So that's all for today. This was a brief overview of this uh, interventional procedures performed for venous insufficiency and varicose veins. If there are any doubts or if there is any feedback, please write to me. Thank you. Have a great day.